Ah, ele estava fazendo ele. Yeah, thanks everybody for coming. We'll start shortly. Welcome, uh, David. Thanks for coming, Berg and Stoya. Uh, and Nathan, nice to see you. Yeah. Today's experimental mass seminar speaker is our, is our own George Spann, who will talk about some very interesting sequences that come up in packing a square into similar rectangles. Go ahead. As usual, please mute yourself unless you have a question, then you are welcome to interrupt. Thank you. Thank you. Let me just uh, share my screen here. Okay, so can everyone hear me and can see? Yep, looks good. Sounds good. Thank you. Yeah, so here's a question about Tiling the square with similar rectangles is something I've been thinking about recently. Right. So how many ways can we partition a square into n similar rectangles? This is a, a sequence in n. And it has recently got a lot of attention on Mastodon, which is like Twitter for math people. Uh, a lot of people have been trying to program it and discuss theoretical stuff. And there's been some blog posts by the person who asked the question there and kind of the leader of the research, which is John Carlos Bayes. Um, here, this is the picture, which is just, uh, I guess, the logo for Max Tadon. And this poem actually got the attention of the New York Times. And they wrote up an article about people's progress. And that's sort of. The goal of this talk is just to sort of summarize well, the work that's been done um, recently and maybe a little bit of my own take on it as well. Okay, so what about when n equals one? Well, this seems easy enough. We just need to divide a square into one similar rectangle. That's cool. It doesn't need to be similar to anything if they're just one of them. So the whole rectangle will work. And in fact, it's a square. Okay, so what about when n equals two? Now we need to have two rectangles which are similar and partition the square. And so there's kind of two ways to do it here. Um, the rectangles have the same size and they both are have a two to one aspect ratio. So we would say r equals one half in this case, um, describing the proportion of the rectangle. But these, these partitions are kind of the same. I mean, it's just a rotation. So we probably want to have some way of dealing with symmetry. If we just, just straight up exclude all of the rotations and reflections, then here, look at this partition into five rectangles. So yes, they're not exactly, we can't get from one to the other by rotation um, or reflection. But if you just look at the blue and the yellow, you could rotate that. And then they would be the same. Um, so instead of trying to work too hard and thinking about all the different ways you can rotate and permute and reflect, let's just say that all partitions with the same aspect ratio and the same number of rectangles are equivalent. So these are both solutions with r equals one half, but r equals one half is the relevant part of this solution. So we want to know how many different aspect ratios are possible if you have n rectangles. OK, so as I mentioned in the abstract, has anyone thought too much about n equals 3? Well, I guess I'll just give one obvious answer here, where we divide, divide it up into three, as, three rectangles with aspect ratio 1 third. Um, so that's cool. We kind of got that by observation almost because it was easy. But how do we rigorously find the rest? Also, um, yeah, interrupt me with questions at any point. The, this talk should be very accessible, I hope so, because something's confusing. 
Hey, George, it's very hard to understand you. Are you... Uh, yeah, speaking... I'm sorry. Two people are unmuted. I won't mention any name. Please check that you are muted unless you have something to say. I don't want to mention any names. Two people are uh, not muted. So is it hard to understand me because my audio is bad? Or is it just because people are unmuted? Is it better now, do you think? I think it's about the same. Uh, my guess is that Neil meant the audio, though. OK, let me try using a different mic, maybe. Oh, yeah, now everybody, now everybody is uh, unmuted. Yeah, go ahead. Um, sorry, just one second. Okay, is this a, does this sound better or worse? I think that's better as long as you're facing towards the microphone. I'm going to try to use this other microphone I have instead of my headphones microphone. Definitely sounds better. Okay, that's that's good. That's good. Right. Okay. So how can we do it into three rectangles? They don't, in this case, they were all the same size, but they don't really need to be all the same size. And we want to try to be a little bit more rigorous about it. So first, what we're going to do is make one horizontal cut here. And it's going to be a one by one square. And we're going to say that the cut is r, a distance r from the bottom. And so the, the aspect rectangle, the aspect ratio of the rectangles that we will be using will be r, because it's r on the short side and one on the long side. And without loss of generality, we can make our next cut in the white region. Making another horizontal cut would force the solution we found already. So let's consider the case of a vertical cut in the white region. Um, but we, so now we need to figure out the orientation of the white rectangles. Since R is less than one, then the rectangle must be oriented horizontally because the longer side is horizontal in one and R is less than one. So now we have three possibilities. Either both the white rectangles are oriented horizontally, both are oriented vertically, or one is horizontally and the other is vertically. So let's take on these cases one by one. So in the case where they're both horizontal, then the two white rectangles are both oriented the same way, both similar, and they both share a side. So that means they have to be congruent. So we know that S must be one half because it's equally dividing up one into two pieces. And so now we can have um, the, we can use the fact that the white, the white rectangle has to be similar to the red rectangle. And so the aspect ratio of R over one must be equal to one minus R over S, which is long to short of the white rectangle. And, um, and so if we plug in S equals one half and, and cross multiply, we just get a linear equation in R with solution R equals two thirds. And I've drawn what it kind of looks like here. Questions so far? Okay, so in the case of where, where both the white rectangles are vertical, then it's pretty similar because S is still equal to one half. But now, instead of R over one equals S over one minus R, I mean, R, one minus R over S, it's S over one minus R now. So now when we cross multiply, we get a quadratic equation. And it turns out that this has no real solutions. So there is no way to do it with both the white rectangles vertical. And the final case is one vertical and one horizontal. OK, so for this first equation here, I'm doing the left rectangle. So R, R over 1 is equal to S over 1 minus R. Long to short over equals long. I mean, short over long equals short over long. And the same thing for the 
r equal r over one is equal to one minus r, which is uh, the the right side of the top right right tangle, and it's equal to um, one minus r over one minus s. So we can cross multiply on both of these equations. On the left one, we get that s is equal to r minus r squared, and we can plug that into the right equation. And so we can get a cubic polynomial here. And this does have a real solution. It's approximately 5698, 0 0.5698. And this is the reciprocal of the square of the plastic number. Well, what's the plastic number? It's kind of a similar equation to the, um, to the golden ratio, but a little bit different. And apparently it comes up in chemistry or something. Okay, so in total there were three yeah, possibilities. I think David Nassin a couple of years ago gave a talk featuring this number, right, David? Yes, I did. It also has to do with tilings of equilateral tri plain tilings of equilateral triangles. The same number comes up. Yeah, it's a good number. Okay. Wow, that's interesting. Yeah, we'll have to look into that. <laughs> yeah, so it, for the n equals three case. There are three possibilities. So the A of three in our sequence is equal to three. And we notice that two of them are rational and one was irrational. And now let's just sort of describe in general what our procedure was to solve this case. So we started with a square and then we repeatedly cut, cut it and we got two smaller rectangles and then we cut those rectangles, one of those rectangles into two smaller rectangles. So these type of cuts are called guillotine cuts. And a guillotine partition is a partition of the square into rectangles using guillotine cuts. So for example, here are six different guillotine partitions of the square. And a guillotine partition of the square into n rectangles could potentially give rise to two to the n different solutions to our problem because each rectangle in the partition could be oriented in two ways. It could be vertically or it could be horizontally. So for each assignment of orientation to the rectangles, then we could get a potentially different solution and a potentially different um, polynomial that it is a root of. Okay. So the number of structurally different distinct guillotine partitions into n rectangles is given by the Schroeder numbers, which we'll say are Sn. And here are the 22 different ways that you can partition a square using guillotine cuts into four rectangles. Um, so what do we mean by structurally distinct? Basically, just if you wiggle the lines around, it's still the same. Um, SN also counts the number of n step lattice paths from 0, 0 to 2n0 using steps of east, which is kind of like a big step, 2, 0. Or you can go northeast to 1, 1, or you can go southeast to 1, minus 1. And we require that the paths do not fall below the x axis. And so the Schroeder numbers have been very well studied. It's uh, A6318 in the OEIS, relatively low number. And here's the generating function. And the definition is vaguely reminiscent of the Catalan numbers. And the generating function is vaguely reminiscent of the Catalan numbers. And we have been able to compute many terms. OK, so let's try to use this, or let's try to be a little bit rigorous about how we're going to try to solve this problem using guillotine cuts. So we need to enumerate all guillotine partitions with n rectangles. For each partition, iterate through all two to the n orientations for each rectangle. And then define some variables. So we're going to let r be the aspect ratio and let ai be the side length of the longest side of the ith rectangle. And then now we're going to try to get a system of equations. So what do you do? Well, for each cut, so let's take this, the first horizontal cut, 
Now we, we know that the total length below the cut must equal the total length above the cut. So A1, so, so the top of this rectangle one here, it has length A1 and it must be equal to A2R plus A3. Um, and similarly for this vertical cut on the left, we have A2 and on the right, we have A3R. So A2 must equal A3R. And then we have two more equations for the sides of the square, which is that they both are adding up to equal one. And now we have four equations and four unknowns. And so we can, we can try to solve it. So the guillotine cut approach George, successfully. Yes. Is A1 always equal to one? A1 is equal to one. Yeah, just because. Oh, oh, you mean in this diagram? I mean always, because our first cut has to be all the way across. So the longest side of oh, but you, we might have cut both of the rectangles. Right, right. Okay. So there could Thank theoretically you. be another cut here vertically that's dividing up rectangle one. Great. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Um, so this approach, um, we've computed that A of four is equal to 11. And here are the 11 ways to do it. There are five rational solutions. Uh, one, one fourth, three fourths, two fifths, and three fifths. And these happen exactly when all the rectangles are horizontal. There are six irrational solutions, and each of them is a root of the third degree of a third degree polynomial maybe similar to the plastic ratio one. Um, but does anyone have any doubts about this guillotine cut approach in general? Like, uh, is there any major problems with going about it like this? I mean, it assumes you can cut all, you're always cutting all the way through. Right. So what if it looks like this, maybe? So how are we going to do this with guillotine cuts? Well, we can't. And it turns out that the smallest, so th with their smallest solution that is not obtainable with guillotine cuts happens with six rectangles. In this, what, in, in this particular diagram, no matter how you try to orient the rectangles, the middle will always vanish to a point. But it turns out with six rectangles, if you cut one of these two like if you cut alpha into two pieces, then there actually is a solution like this. Um, yeah, so that's kind of sad. So here's another method. So we need a better way of generating the arrangements. So we say arrangement, I kind of mean, um, kind of, uh, we're not taking into account the square of the rectangles, but we are taking into account which ones are next to which ones. And again, you can kind of slide around the lines and it doesn't really change the arrangement. Um, so we need to generate these arrangements somehow. Um, and in a tiling with n rectangles, there are at most n minus one internal horizontal lines. Um, to see this, you can just take at most one for the top of each rectangle minus the very top. Um, and so we can slide these horizontal lines around without changing the arrangement. And we can wait and we can slide them until each line is on a grid line of the n by n grid, because there's n minus one of them. Um, so example for here, we slid the blue line, I mean, the line between the blue and the yellow into the middle. And then we slid the line between the red into the middle as well. And so now it's kind of like a two by two grid. And if this two by two grid is assigned colors, we can say red is one, blue is two, and yellow is three. And so this is like a coloring of the two by two grid into three colors. And we can represent it nicely with a matrix. Um, since there was only, there was three colors, and I said we were going to use a three by three grid, but it turns out there was only two horizontal, or one horizontal, line and one vertical line inside. So we only needed a two by two matrix. Um, right, so in order to generate arrangements, well, we could just generate all possible colorings of an n by n grid into n colors. 
And then we could check whether each color is connected and forms a rectangle. Now, in practice, this sounds like it's going to be a massive computation, but we don't need to actually generate all possible colorings. We can be a little bit more efficient about generating them, but we will still find all of them this way. Um, okay, so with a few symmetries removed, here are the possible arrangements for four rectangles. Um, now notice that we didn't actually ever need a four by four grid um, because all the ones that all the colorings of a four by four grid that didn't violate any of the rules had repeated rows or columns. So they can kind of be shrunk down into something smaller. And so this is the shrunk versions of them. And notice even now there is still some kind of equivalence. If you look at the second one and you look at the fourth one, so here we have in the second one, we have two, two, and we have four, four. And in the fourth one, we have two, two, and th three, three. So if there is a solution to the second one, it'll also be a solution to the fourth one because you can kind of swap the first row and the second row and get an equivalent partition. And so it's really, really difficult to actually optimize this to remove all possible symmetries that will give you the same aspect ratio. So what's the algorithm look like? OK, so same thing. We need to generate all arrangements using grid coloring. For each arrangement, we need to assign an orientation to each of the rectangles. And then once we have all the orientations, then we can do the method of before of defining the variables and generating a system of equations. We can use linear algebra to solve for the polynomial that R must satisfy. And then we can check to see that that polynomial has a real root in between 0 and 1 and that none of the rectangles have size zero. So this is a pretty good approach. And Ian Henderson used it to compute a lot of, a few more terms. So for n equals five, here are the 51 solutions. Um, note this one on the bottom right. Maybe it'll come up later in the talk. Um, and then here's the 245 solutions for n equals six. So how far can we go? Um, this, our progress is currently recorded in A359146 in the OEIS. Ian Henderson computed the first eight terms using this method and then ran into computational difficulties. A couple of weeks ago, there was a new progress. David Einstein computed two more terms. And it used a graph theory approach, which is closely connected to electrical networks. And if I have time at the end, I will tell you a little bit about that. OK, so let's now kind of shift gears a little bit um, and try to tackle a different question, which is which aspect ratios are possible? So if we allow any finite number of rectangles, then what are the possible ratios? So first question, are all rational numbers possible? So to start, here's an example. Say R is equal to 14 over 47. We can recall the continued fraction expansion of rational number. So 14 over 47 is equal to 1 over 47 over 14. And then 47 over 14 is between 3 and 4. So we can write it as 3 plus 5 over 14. And then 5 over 14 is 1 over 14 over 5. And 14 over 5 is between 2 and 3. So we can write it as 2 plus 4 over 5. And then we can write 4 over 5 as 1 plus 1 over 4. And so. Here we get a sequence 3, 2, 1, 4 um, corresponding to the numbers in the final fraction expansion. And here's the thing that if you've seen continued fractions before, you've probably already seen. So now we can try to tile a, 47, a 14 by 47 rectangle with squares. So first of all, we can chop off three 14 by 14 squares. And then we can chop 
yeah, we're left with a five by 14, so we can chop off two five by five squares. And now we're left with a five by four, so we can chop off a four by four square. And then finally, we're left with a four by one, so we can chop it into four one by one squares. And does this sequence of three, two, one, four look familiar in this picture? Yes, this is um, the continued fraction expansion of 14 over 47. So now this is what I call the method of squinty vision. We can, um, yeah, I, I really just scaled the aspect ratio of the previous picture and tried to make it into a square. So now we, are, we have a tiling of the square and all of the rectangles are similar because they all used to be squares. And so the rectangles in this picture now have aspect ratio 14 over 47, because that's what we needed to scale them by to make the big thing into a square. So this shows that there will be solutions for any rational number. Why? Well, if you have any rational number, you can write out the continued fraction expansion. And then you can do our lovely procedure here to get some dissection of a rectangle into squares, where the rectangle has ratio of the side lengths to be equal to our rational number. And then we can squint a little bit, and now we have a solution. We have a partition of a square into rectangles that all have that aspect ratio which is the rational number that we wanted. Um, we can also go backward. So if all the rectangles in our tiling are oriented the same way, then we can produce a tiling of a rectangle with squares by unsquinting. In 1903, Max Den proved that in any tiling of a rectangle with finitely many squares, the aspect ratio of the rectangle must be rational. So if we go backward and end up with a tiling of a rectangle into squares, we know that the, ra the ratio of the edges, the ratio of the sides must be rational by this theorem. And if you also look at the proof, it's pretty, you can also figure out that the, all of the squares themselves must also be rational. So this tells us that in any solution uh, of our problem, where we partition a square into rectangles that are all pointing the same way, then the, the ratio must be rational. OK, so what about tiling a rectangle with the fewest number of squares? So we had this, this method of using continued fraction expansion, um, but does it actually give the tiling into the fewest number of squares? So here we have a 5 by 6 rectangle. And we chopped off a five by five, and then we were left with five one by ones. But can we do better? Yeah, so it turns out you can do better. Here we have two three by threes to make six, and then three two by twos at the top. And so that's a little bit unfortunate. If we're trying to tile with the fewest number of rectangles, we can't just use the continued fraction method. Um, how many rectangles does the continued fraction method need? Well, you basically add up all the numbers in the sequence of the continued fraction expansion. So here we had one big rectangle and then five little, so we needed one plus five to get the ratio of five sixths. Okay, so here's, here's a problem. Given two natural numbers, n and m, find the minimum number of integer sided squares required to tile the n by m rectangle. And we're gonna call this number h of n m. So it turns out that this has been researched extensively. And there's a website which has a massive tab, a table with all of the results. Um, now this problem is a little bit different, right? Because let's say we had six over five, we're only allowed to tile using integer sided squares. 
And you might think, well, maybe we can get fewer squares if we kind of expand it up. Maybe we did 12 by 10 instead of 6 by 5. And now, because we are allowed to use integer sided squares, or we're required to use integer sided squares, we have more options. So maybe we can do it with fewer squares if we make things bigger. However, it is conjectured that h of dn dm is equal to h of nm, which is very surprising. It's kind of saying that, like, if you're trying to tackle the five by six case, you might as well just have. You might as well just set n equal to five and, and m equal to six. And all the scaled up versions of it, it turns out we can't use fewer rectangles. We can't use fewer squares. No one has figured out a case where we can. So does this help us? Well, so A210517 in the OAS gives the number of rectangles dissectable into n squares unique up to aspect ratio, but we only know eight terms. If we did, um, if we did know a lot of terms of this sequence, then maybe we can go backwards and try to convert the solutions of rectangles into n squares into square into n rectangles, um, at least for the rational case. Um, but there is still a problem. So what's the problem? Well, here's a question. What if sometimes we need to put the rectangles in different orientations? So if we're trying to solve for five, six or something, what if, I mean, we know that if all of the rectangles are oriented the same way, the solution is rational, but we don't know if there exists any rational ratios such that in any minimum partition of the square into, into rectangles with aspect ratio r, does there exist two rectangles in different orientations? So basically, is it, is it the case that for some rational numbers, the optimal way to do it requires putting some of them in different orientations? If that's the case, then the squinting method will not produce squares. But I actually, I have no idea if this is true or not. Um, I have not found any examples where it was there was a more efficient way to do it by putting things in different orientations for the rational case. OK, what about which irrational numbers are possible? So let's first consider the case of tilings obtainable from guillotine cuts. Let TR be the rectangle with ratio R. And let SR be the set of all possible ratios of rectangles that are buildable using rectangles similar to TR. So basically what we're going to do is we're going to start with um, we're going to start with some TRs and we're going to put them together and we're going to see what different rectangles we can make with them. And we are finally interested in determining for which r is 1 in s sub r. If 1 is in s sub r, then we can make a square using, using rectangles with ratio r. So guillotine cut tilings can be built up from smaller pieces. Um, basically, uh, on e whenever we make a cut, on each side, we must have a rectangle with ratio in S sub R. Um, so say the ratios on each side of the cut are R1 and R2. Then the ratio of the rectangle being divided by the cut is either R1 plus R2, 1 over R1 plus R2, R1 plus 1 over R2, or 1 over R1 plus 1 over R2. And to sort of help you see why this is, here's an example. So here we made a guillotine cut. On the left, we had a, ratio, a rectangle with ratio R1, and we're assuming sort of like an induction type of thing that R1 is buildable using rectangles of ratio R, and R2 is also buildable using rectangles of ratio R. Well, what do we get when we line them up next to each other here? 
Well, now we have a bigger rectangle with ratio R1 plus R2, because the long side is R1 plus R2 and the short side is still one. Um, so any guillotine cut diagram has to be built up from repeated joins and rotations. So we conclude that S sub R must be closed under addition and multiplicative inverses. And this fits with what we know about continued fractions. So it is possible to get from any rational to any other rational with just using the operations of addition and reciprocal. In the continued fraction expansion, you go from one and you just repeatedly take the inverse or add it, add it to multiple copies of one. And you're able to produce any rational number. And similarly, you can do the process in reverse. So here's another way we could have solved the n equals three case. We could have had this blue rectangle here, um, and this is the smallest one, so this is where we're starting. And we're saying the smaller side is r and the longer side is one. And then the yellow rectangle shares this one side, so I put a one over here. And then it also has aspect ratio r, so the big side must be one over r. Right, And so now the aspect ratio of the blue plus the yellow is one to R plus one over R. Because R plus one over R is the top of the blue and the yellow. Um, yeah, so now we're going to rescale and remember that we figured out the ratio of the blue plus the yellow. So now the short side of the blue plus the yellow is one over R plus one over R and the long side is one. And then if the long side is one, then the long side of the red is also one. So the short side of the red must be R. And so now the ratio of this conglomeration is R plus one over R plus one over R. So, and then the other side is one, so that's fine. So we get something that looks very much like a continued fraction here. And we can simplify this. So if we just do a little bit of adding fractions, we get that this is equal to r cubed plus 2r over r squared plus 1. And since we want the rectangle to actually be a square, we can set the fraction equal to 1. So r cubed plus 2r is equal to r squared plus 1. And this gives the polynomial r cubed minus r squared plus 2r minus 1. And this is the same one that gave us the solution that was very similar to the plastic ratio. Yeah, so basically, given any expression like this here, with um, looking kind of like a continued fraction, we can get a rational expression. And from a rational expression, we can get a polynomial. Um, so here, recall in the n equals 4 case, we found 11 solutions. So the rational solutions are 1, 1 4, 3 fourths, and 2 fifths and 3 fifths. So except for 1, these are the rational numbers that have continued fraction expansion sequence adding up to 4. And the irrational solutions are the real positive roots to the following third degree polynomials. So here are all the polynomials. Does anyone notice anything about these polynomials? What's something they all have in common besides being degree three? Alternating signs. Yeah, exactly. So they have alternating coefficients. And it turns out this is not a coincidence. So we got these polynomials by setting the numerator and denominator of a rational expression equal to each other. And it is not too hard to see that the numerator and the denominator are always polynomials with positive coefficients, first of all, and that they are always of the form even function over odd function or odd function over even function. Um, so here is a, a little bit to help you see why that is. So remember that the two operations we use to make the rational functions are adding and taping the reciprocal. 
Well, if you take the reciprocal of odd over even, you get even over odd. And if you take the reciprocal of even over odd, you get odd over even. So clearly that preserves the property. And then for addition, all we need to do is a little bit of adding fractions here. So if we have odd over even plus even over odd, then we get odd times odd plus even times even over even times odd. And what, because these are, yeah, we to multiply the polynomials, we add the exponents. So odd plus odd would be even. And even, I mean, odd times odd would be even, and even times even would be even. So in this case, we get even over odd. And the other two cases are very similar. And so this shows that as we're building up our rational expression, we're always ending up with polynomials with like an even, even exponents on the top, odd exponents on the bottom, and all positive. So when we set them equal to each other, then we will get a polynomial with alternating coefficients. OK, so we know that if 1 is in S sub r, then r had better be the root of some polynomial with alternating coefficients. But we also were kind of limiting ourselves to looking at the guillotine partitions in this, in this analysis. So it turns out that this problem has been solved. And there's a very amazing theorem which settles the question. Um, yeah, so this was proved in 1994 by Lakskovich and Sekeris, and also independently by Freeling and Rin in the same year. And the theorem says that a square can be partitioned into finitely many rectangles with ratio r if and only if r is algebraic and all of its conjugates have positive real part. Well, yeah, so recall basically if r is algebraic, it is a solution to some polynomial, and then the conjugate roots are just the other solutions to that polynomial, potentially complex. And this does make a little bit of sense, first of all, because there can't be any negative real solutions to an alternating polynomial. Because if, if, if x is negative, then you'll have all in the alternating polynomial with a negative number plugged in, then everything will have the same sign. All the terms will have the same sign, so you can't equal 0. But here's another theorem that will help us see what's going on a little bit more. So it was used in the proof, and it's from Wall in 1945. Wall's theorem. So it says let p of x be some polynomial, and let q of x be the alternating term starting from the first term, and let r of x be the alternating term starting from the second term. So all of the roots of p of x have positive real part if and only if minus r of x over q of x. So what is this doing? We're putting the ones, yeah, so if you have an alternating polynomial, you're putting all of the negative ones on top and making them positive. And then you're putting all the positive ones on the bottom, which is kind of just like what we were doing. And we're saying this is equal to, yeah, so all the, all the roots have positive real part if we can write this as some kind of continued fraction expansion. And the CNs just need to be any positive rational number. And so what does this tell us? So these are, the these are exactly the polynomials that we were generating with the guillotine cuts. So amazingly, the solutions that we can get by doing the guillotine cuts are actually everything that you can get. Um, if, if, R is, if R is a solution to some possible way of tiling, not with necessarily guillotine cuts, it's also some solution using guillotine cuts only although probably it will take many more rectangles. Um, and yeah, so that is basically pretty much what I want to talk about. I, yeah, maybe I'll just end now then, uh, a couple more minutes, but. Thank I'm you getting... for the fascinating talk. So this was an exposition. Uh, do you have anything? Uh, that you define yourself? Well, the stuff about the squinty vision was, was my idea, which it's I still very think. very nice. So that's a new approach, a, a new yeah. way of looking at it. 
I still think it can be useful, although I kind of me I need to resolve that open problem that I mentioned before it can really be useful. Because mm -hmm. the squinty vision only works if you're transforming rectangle if all the rectangles get squinted into squares. But maybe it's possible that if you put two rectangles in different orientations, then you can get a, a more optimal tiling. So I need to prove that that doesn't happen. Ah, good luck. Are there questions for George? So I have another question. So if you have a, you mentioned by David Einstein, the electrical network, electric, uh, can you say one, something about it? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, so I, I, I can, um, let me share, let me stop sharing this and then, let me see. Yeah, so let's say you have a, um, a tiling into squares like we've been doing. Now we can associate with this a graph. And so the vertices are going to be um, horizontal lines. Um, so here we have one horizontal line in the middle and then one on the top and the bottom. And then the edges between them are when two horizontal lines are being shared by a rectangle. Um, I guess this example is not very, very nice, but we'll have two edges and then we'll have one directed edge down here corresponding to all the rectangles. Um, so the edges are, are rectangles. And so similar to how we went from a partition to a graph, um, you can also go from a graph to a partition. And so basically one of the ideas here is that we can start enumerating graphs and then use those to construct the rectangles. And then we can also do an electrical network approach. So basically the, 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 we can assign a current to each edge, which is equal to the length of the, um, yeah, so if this is an edge from this line to this line, then we can say its current is kind of equal to the length, the horizontal length here. And so now we kind of have a Kirchhoff's law situation where the incoming currents from all of the edges of this horizontal line must be equal to the outgoing. And so we can, we can solve for the resistance of the graph and, and this will help us generate the rational function corresponding to the tiling. Um, Thank you. Yeah, I'm still trying to, I'm still trying to understand a little bit of the details of it because um, yeah, it was kind of a recent result and the code is a little bit hard to understand, but I think I think the connection is very nice. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, this ends this format part of the talk. Uh, Robert, please stop recording. Uh,